just want to introduce you firstly to our panel today. So we have Neve Bushnell, as you know, from Tech Ireland. Uh, we have Maeve Redmond, who is uh, from uh, My Wall Street, which is formerly Rubicoin. We have um, Alvin Hunt from Hexafly, uh, Shane Kern from Evervolt, and Marianne, who you heard speak earlier. And I just, uh, I, I suppose, introduced the theme of the future investing to you when we were discussing um, themes around what, what our panels were going to be about. And uh, we came across a, a quote from um, John Collison. Um, and it said, um, if you think something is important but older people, then you don't hold it in high regard. There's a reasonable chance that you're right and they're wrong. Status lags a generation or more. And that resonated with us. Um, so I suppose, Shane, I might start with you. Um, I've seen you quoted as saying that you know you 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 operate a successful business, but everything that you do or talk about is introduced by, you be, by being about the fact that you're 18 years old. Is that a frustration for you? And B, are they missing the point? Yeah, I mean it's certainly a frustration, especially if you're kind of in the early stages of, um, I suppose we'll say an investment meeting. You know that's what sort of what we're going through right now. Yeah. So you walk in in the first 10 minutes, you're kind of you trying to lay down the gauntlet slightly. They, you know, they, they ask, you know, how are you doing in college? Which, you know, the answer to that's very poorly as a result of um, all the other ventures I'm doing. Um, but it, it takes quite a, lot, quite a lot of time to actually show them that you mean business. Um, then at the same time, the age becomes kind of the driving factor behind a lot of their decisions. And it's really, really difficult to kind of be treated for better or for worse at the same level. Um, and it's, it's both a blessing and a curse because it means they always call your bluff because they always think you're lying which can work in your favor or it can work massively against you. But um, overall, I think it's, it's a good thing, but at the same time, it's really, really difficult for, for young founders. And I think that's part of the reason why young founders don't do it as much as people who have a little bit more experience because they just see it as a challenge as a result of the kind of the first five or 10 minutes that they have with a particular meeting, whether it's for investment or otherwise. Yeah, and Alv Alvin, is that something that you can identify with? Yeah, I suppose being being a young entrepreneur, there's uh, you know you you have you, you have to I suppose prove yourself you know in, in some regards because you don't have a huge amount of you know uh, work experience to kind of back up, especially if you're doing a, a new venture that's totally you know unrelated to what you've done previously. So um, so yeah, there's there's an element of that I suppose yeah. Yeah, and Maeve, in my Wall Street, that must be something that you can identify in terms of the, you know, people who are challenging or are looking for other alternatives to what would have been traditional banking. This is a fintech yeah. um, solution. So, can you talk us through your experience of that? When you look at the likes of the success of Indiegogo um, and Kickstarter, mm -hmm. um, you can see that young people are putting their money into these, you know, something that resonates with them that impacts on their life. So, how, do, how have you seen that in? in the likes of my Wall Street? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I can see relations there between the customer base in my Wall Street and people who would want to fund with things like Kickstarter and Indiegogo. I think those kind of funded campaigns are a symptom of younger people saying they want more. You know, they want more options. They want to push at tech and apps and, and finance and solutions. And they want it to work quicker, better, and in a way that suits them. You know, and I think they're the people who kind of prescribe what may happen next. Um, the reason why I was smiling so broadly when Shane was speaking is he would have worked with us on things in uh, my Wall Street. And I don't think I was asking Shane how college was going at the time. I think I might have been asking him how school was going. <laughs> um, but, you know, like Shane, you would have mean you would have worked on tech solutions and you would have actually taught me things. And if my ears had been closed, yeah. if I was arrogant enough to think that a younger generation couldn't teach you anything, you're going to possibly miss out on an opportunity for an idea or for a venture or for an investment. And Marianne, that's something we addressed earlier when we talk about diversity. It's not just about gender. It's about, it's about age profile. It's about culture and what they're bringing to the background. We can see that companies are doing better when they have not only got diverse founders, but diverse investment as well. So it's really interesting listening to the West Coast tech and what they're doing to bring those <coughs> younger, more diverse entrepreneurs back into the ecosystem as investors. Yeah, I think that's important because, you know, if you've got an investor who's in your shoes or closer to it, they're going to understand your issues and there's going to be a little bit less frustration. And they can, you know, it, when we're investing in a group environment, we're kind of listening to each other and talking with each other. Mm -hmm. So if you've got somebody who understands your business or how, you know, you know how you can really grow your business, um, they're going to be able to explain it to other investors and we're going to go, ah, oh, light bulb turns on. Yeah. yeah. I, Neve, do you see this as, as something that, is it a communication piece or, and how we're engaging with younger entrepreneurs and, um, and getting them back into that kind of investor 
um, environment then when you know they're coming out the other side of, of, of exits and, and trying to get them back in is that is that about our communication is it about how we're, how we're engaging with them yeah, younger people as entrepreneurs yeah yeah and, and, and investors and investors yeah I mean you know I, I think it comes it, it has to go you know from the bottom up and from the top down right you know so I was uh, speaking at I wish which is a you know a stem conference for girls in transition year in Ireland and uh, one of the piece of you know this big room of, of, of girls from all over the country in the RDS there earlier this week and uh, one of the, the survey pieces that they shared was that they had surveyed all the girls beforehand to ask them how many of their parents had uh, STEM, had, 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 had innovation related jobs, so tech, you know, coding, data science, anything engineering, anything at all like that, a really broad, and uh, you know, 35% or something had. So you're talking to a population of 65% of the population, you know, of, of, of women coming up and going, think about STEM, and they're going, well, you know, there's nothing around me to make me think about that. Why would I think about that? So I think that's the uphill challenge when it comes to um, getting us all, as when, young, when younger people, to not go into kind of the professional services firms or become teachers. All of those jobs are amazing. But you need to be surrounded by entrepreneurs to think entrepreneurially almost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then investing is kind of another step in that. I mean, it all starts with kind of curiosity, you know, and if you're curious, the chances are that you're going to let that take you in different directions and the chances are you're going to be an entrepreneur at some point and a failed entrepreneur before you become anything else. And there are statistics around that actually uh, in relation to um, um, if people, you know, if, if they see it, they can be it. Um, so really interesting to see. I suppose there's no real quick fix to this. This is going to be a longer term piece, isn't it? Really, this is going to be starting these processes now and seeing them come out. Yeah, I mean, it's the Shane. Shane, yeah. Shane is the answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, and people like him. You know, it's the role models. It's having, you know, it's, it, yeah, you, you know, you hang around to people who, who remind you of yourself. So, you know, I would guess that in these guys' circles, there are more potential and actual entrepreneurs than there are in many other people's circles. It's just the way it goes. Mm -hmm. You need people who've walked the walk, really, to actually understand what it might be like to live it. Yeah, big time. Yeah. And you need to be inspired by them. You know, I mean, mm. I hung out with smarter people than me in school, and therefore I got better grades. I mean, it's, a, it's, mm. it's kind of a no-brainer. You are, I think, the result of the five people you hang out with, yeah. 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 Um, Alvin, um, you know, with the likes of Hexafly, um, you are delivering a double bottom line, really, because you're looking at a, a company that has um, a, a social and sustainable impact on the mm -hmm. environment as well as returns for the investor. Um, is that something that is going to be, you know, are there challenges around that for you as a CEO? Um, and, and will there be more processes, do you feel, around um, how you measure the social impact that you're going to have for, as a business? Yeah, so I think like in our situation, we're kind of quite fortunate in that what we're doing is already quite sustainable, um, and it's easy to kind of to see that at a bigger level. But I suppose you know it's at a smaller level, uh, you know, and kind of um, where our product goes, what customer we sell to, and things like that. You can you can you can make those uh, I suppose societal impact choices, and you can make those decisions. But I, what, what we're doing at the moment, we're in a we're in a, a sustainability market. We're seeing a huge drive. Um, from our customers wanting to, you know, move towards sustainability and have a, you know, they're they're trying to change their systems to have a bigger social impact. So it's kind of, in many sense, it's kind of easy for us as a company at, at the moment. Um, we just have to provide them with those solutions. But yeah, I mean, there's going to be there's going to be challenges for companies to be able to, you know, um, assess their their own sustainability, their own, you know, what kind of impact they can have. But if they can do that, there's there's huge benefits to it because. Um, the bigger market is moving towards that. Cost, con, the consu you know, consumers are, are you know, um, it's something that they want to see in, in mm -hmm. various different products and services. So there's definitely net benefits to making those kind of choices. Um, so are, are the frameworks around that at the moment in terms of you know you, that measuring that? So when you look at sort of investors are going to be looking at doing the same level of due diligence as they would on your financials and your projections as they are on the social impact aspect. Are there, yeah. are the frameworks there at the moment for any of that? I think it depends on different investors, uh, again, what they're looking for. So there are, there are certain frameworks. I mean, uh, they need to grow. I mean, you have, um, like we, we were assessed on things like emissions by, you know, uh, carbon emissions by certain investors. Yeah. That was more at a kind of a governmental kind of state level as well. Yeah. Um, but then certain VCs, they would, they would have um, 
I suppose, higher criteria on that sustainability uh, assessment. Um, again, it's, it, it, it's different across, uh, across the board, but um, it's, it is quite difficult to assess your yeah. business, and I suppose it's a self-assessment. There are services out there that help with that, and a lot, there's even companies that, and startups that have set up that you know, uh, actually do that. Um, but I think w whether it's with our company or whether it's with you know, startups in general, there's definitely huge net benefits to looking into this and to actually self-assessing yourself and then being able to tell that story to investors and you know, consumers as well. And Marianne, are, there, are, there, are you seeing any statistics in relation to the type of investors who's investing in you know, this double impact into sustainable businesses like this, social impact? You know, not so much. Okay. I mean, we did see a little bit that women care about it more yeah. than men. But I, you know, I'm starting to just, I guess with my eyeballs, I'm just starting to see um, it really is a range of people. I see, I see some older men. Um, and maybe it's just tapping into, you know, when you're making an investment, it's your money. You can spend it however it gives you joy, right? So, yeah, you want to, you know, some people are going to care a lot more about the financial return. Mm. But a lot of people, you know, are making some investments because they know it's going to make a difference in however they care about it. Yeah. And so um, I do see really quite a range of demographics and haven't figured out the pattern yet. But what I do see is as more people get excited about it, it just keeps growing. It'd be really interesting to see how that yeah. develops, won't it? Yeah. yeah. What the statistics come out on that. Maybe have you any thoughts in relation to, you know, um, the positive impact that mm -hmm. businesses can make and not just merely avoiding negative ones? Yeah, like I think when it comes to social impact, it's... Um, like demonstrating, I suppose, a worthy level um, of influence there or trying to have good corporate governance is a key indicator of the internal health of a company. Mm. So it kind of brings it back to the beginning, you know, what's the values? Are the founders still bought in from the top? Are they governing from the top in the correct way? It'll probably help the staff buy in if we all understand what we're trying to do together. So I, like the way I see it is we have a category in the My Wall Street app called socially responsible investments. and. There's three layers, and three layers are what I look at when I think if this is this company socially responsible or not. And it's um, your customers. So how is yeah. their data been handled? How are they? How do they feel? The shareholders of that company. You know, what's the actual feeling there? What's the level of corporate governance? Is it healthy? And then if the utility of the business suits the planet. You know, so you mentioned emissions, Alvin. We'll all remember what happened with Volkswagen, although I think they bounced back quite well. Um, if the utility of the business has an effect on the planet, are they at least thinking ahead about whether it's going to impact us negatively or not? Okay, great. Shane, just to ch ch change tax slightly, Shane was the uh, former BT Scientist of the Year winner. Um, and just to talk a little bit about how important the roles of, and Neva might bring you in on this as well, um, innovation hubs are and accelerators and uh, the junior entrepreneur program that, um, that Jerry Canelli is running at the moment. Um, how important is that? for us in terms of pipeline for entrepreneurs? Yeah, I think one of the, the great things about those programs is that they sometimes create a pretty safe test bed for you to try things out. Yeah. And the cost of failing is actually a lot lower than it would be had you gone out and raised a full venture round from um, you know, some folks in the Bay Area or wherever. Um, so that's one angle to it from a commercial perspective. With things like the, the Young Scientists, um, I think one of the great things it does is it basically increases the level of stubbornness in, in youth, which is great. <laughs> Tenacity. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, because people, you you know, they don't they don't see failure as even not even not only an option, but failure just doesn't exist because you create a project, you present it, and you have good fun doing it. Um, and that's in practice what the, the real world is. Um, no matter what age people are, they're still the same people as they were when they're 16, presenting their young scientist project in uh, in the RDS with 550 other schools. Um, so that's that's I think one of the great things about it, and it's it's definitely kind of feeding through and people are getting younger or are getting older slower now um, to a certain extent and that they're yeah they're becoming a bit more um, I guess a forward looking in terms of their own age but mm. at the same time they still behave like 15 year olds which is great <laughs> um, but it means that um, because everyone goes to college now it's, it's sort of becoming a much much more standard thing that these things are passing through into you know mid-20s and that's where um, you know spin out projects from universities are great like Nova UCD um, you know Trinity was Absolutely. similar one, DCU was a similar one and it's uh, I think it's, they're great schemes. 
I need that talks a little bit. I was saying uh, to to you when you were talking about the earlier about these uh, young that was girls in in that in the the, the uh, environment Irish, yeah. that you were in, yeah, that are surrounded by um, you know medics or um, science background. Anyone from that's yeah. STEM and. I mean, I mean, the, the 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 funny thing, you know, the you know, every every cloud has a silver lining, and, and the silver lining maybe around the lack of early stage funding for companies is that they have to figure out what exactly they're doing before they get any money to take it any further. Because Shane's point is 100%, and, and people who've been entrepreneurs, the minute you get money, the bigger your mistakes become, right? Mm. So the chances are that if you hold out and you don't get money because you don't have access to it or because you choose not to go there and keep your company a project for as long as possible, your chances then of success and being able to plug money into the right places when you do get it instead of leaving it sit in the bank or making big mistakes with it, it are much higher. So. You know, if I was to, you know, put on my optimistic hat, which is always on, uh, you know, the plus side of very little early stage money in Ireland is that people are having to just figure it out, you know, and if you can't come to revenue, I mean, there's lots of companies that need a lot of investment before they can come to revenue, but, you know, if you can't do something, a service before the product or some kind of revenue MVP, um, you know, maybe you're not solving a problem. Yeah, yeah problem just isn't there is when you look at the entrepreneurs and and, and you know bringing them on and ed educating them showing them and giving them role models are we still in a scenario whereby with the emphasis on um, foreign direct investment it's on about it's on jobs and you look at the likes of Facebook and Google and they're announcing jobs here and um, how do we counteract that how do we not lose our talent into these big global players yeah, I mean, Irish companies need to become household names in Ireland. They need to become? Uh, household names yeah. in Ireland. And that's, that's a little counterintuitive, and this is the problem that we have, because most of the great Irish companies, I mean, how many people know Rubicoin? I mean, you're, you're the wrong room to do this in. <laughs> people know Rubicoin, or my, my Wall Street. But, I mean, seriously, if you walk down the street in Dublin, how many people will know Finergo? How many people will know Fexco? How many people will know these huge Irish companies that are B2B, software, innovation-driven companies that are killing it globally. Nobody. Nobody will know them. And one of the reasons for that is because they don't sell into Ireland. Like the multinationals that are sitting here, their market is not this country because this country's market is, is absolutely super small for them. So we need to know who those companies are. We need to be able to, you know, I always have this image of like walking around Dublin and seeing big plaques. A startup was founded here. A startup is here. Look upstairs. There's four people in a startup there. You know, I mean, and that's kind of silly, but just that kind of visibility of, by the way, what you think is over there is actually all around you, and it's not the future, it's the present. So we need, we need creative ways. We need to use our arts community maybe to kind of like let people know this is, these, these guys are all here. They live here. They're building here. This is happening here, and I think most people just don't realize that. Yeah, absolutely. We're nearly a year to the day, um, and very, very soon, next month, isn't it, um, to when you launched your 100 million uh, Yes, yes, yeah. last International year. International Women's Day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So have you anything that you'd want to share with us? I cannot share right now. <laughs> really? No early really? statistics? OK, <laughs> very good. OK, we'll have it's, to wait for good, another month. It's good and bad news. Good and bad news. OK, yeah. so we have another month to wait. Yeah. Great, we look forward to it. Marianne, have you any final thoughts for us in relation to, you know, how we continue to encourage and how we embrace the diversity and the, the value that young entrepreneurs are bringing both as investors, well, really, I suppose, as investors to the table? Well, yeah, I think it is really the entrepreneurs, you yeah. know, and I can't speak to the Irish market, but I know that, um, you know, a lot of the very best hot deals in the US, and I don't mean Silicon Valley, I mean where I'm from, Kansas City, are coming from the, the young entrepreneurs. Mm. And so, you know, just really thinking about where the cool thinking is from, a, from an entrepreneurial investment opportunity, mm. um, you know, it's, it's kind of understanding um, the young people and being able to market ourselves. I'm the old person on the panel, you know, figuring out how I'm, you know, how I'm relevant and how I might be a good 
um, mentor or something like that. I had another thought, and I don't know if this is possible on the exit possibility, because I mean, we as angels need to have those exits, right? We need to have the returns back in. So there's a little bit of a push-pull between keeping them here and, and doing an acquisition. Yeah. But um, I, I did have the opportunity to be, to um, one of my first investments was acquired by a Chinese company. Mm. But what happened was they structured the deal such that the company still got to stay in our community and pretty independent from the organization. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I wonder if there aren't more ways to have those kinds of exits and mm -hmm. at least stay here in, in Ireland, even though they're part of you know, Microsoft or whatever. Yeah. 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 yeah, that happens here. It okay. does happen here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you do see it. And you saw there, would, it was very interesting to see the Whole Foods market that were bought by Amazon, and there was a real kind of sense of what are they going to do with it? Are they going to transform it? And largely, it's been left mm -hmm. to its own devices, although the product is there. Right. You do see it. Um, Shane and Alvin, and Maeve as well, um, uh, as younger members of our panel. Um, Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, and even Marianne. <laughs> um, thinking to the future. Um, what is it that's going to, you know, you know, you, you know, hopefully you've made your exit um, and now you want to come back into the ecosystem because I think that is something that you see time and time again with young entrepreneurs or, or, or you know, uh, you know they, they do it again and again. Either they start up another business or they want to go back into the ecosystem and invest and help companies that they, because they identify with the journey, they understand that they can leverage their, the network that's there and help these companies to grow. Um, and uh, what is it would be important for you in terms of coming back into the ecosystem as an investor in the future? What would the, those kind of key things be that we can learn from as HBAN and, and as the wider community? I think one of the first things is um, kind of having a problem-focused attitude. And there's a bit of survivorship bias there in the sense that most of the companies that get to that stage get acquired um, because the founders are probably driven by solving a problem rather than having a solution looking for a problem. Um, which means that when you're investing, particularly in seed deals, that it's entirely founder-driven and that it's someone who um, sort of constantly doesn't really, regardless of the kind of commercial angle they have on it, that they don't really care about how elegant their solution is. Yeah. Um, I mean, I sort of started off the wrong way in the sense that I kind of started building solutions for stuff and they're great solutions, but I kind of realized that um, just looking at problems around you is the easiest way of doing it. Mm. Um, from an angel perspective, it probably makes sense to invest in things that are um, things that you can kind of conceptualize and that you've experienced before. Um, but a lot of the kind of re sort of, re I suppose, serial entrepreneurs, um, they start developing things that are based on the problems they had in their previous company. Mm -hmm. And you see the sort of evolution of these entrepreneurs that start one company, they see that something was really, really horrible in the industry, regardless of how their previous company fared, if, whether, it was, uh, whether it was acquired or whether it went bust. Um, they move on to the next thing and solve that problem. And it's sort of a, um, sort of a chain reaction. Um, and it's, it's sort of easy to tell that. You look, even if you look at someone's LinkedIn page, you can see that that's the case. And I think they're really good indicators. Or, or they're kind of core heuristics, but they work quite well for um, kind of the pre due diligence stage of angel investing. I suppose that you know the statistics would show that like companies fail not because they're not developing a beautiful product, it's because they don't have customers for it. So really understanding what that need is in the market before you even go there is so important. Alvin, you thoughts yeah, on that? So uh, I suppose for me, if I was in you know going into the ecosystem of investing, I'd probably be looking at I suppose what is the, the most cutting edge technology, and I suppose the more future focused, the better in my book it would be. I feel like that in terms of an investing timeline, you should be looking at technologies that are not like ready to market in five years, but you know, it should be mo even more future focused to like 10, 50 years ahead of time, because by the time you know, that investment has gone in, that company has reached maturity, the global marketplace has caught up and there's other companies there. So identifying opportunities that are you know, so far ahead uh, that it seems crazy now, but in a couple of years time, it's like, well, it's, com you know, it's common sense and it was a great idea to invest in that. Um, so that would be kind of what I would be looking at. Um, and I feel like I would be able to hopefully identify what those companies are and what those trends would be. But um, I suppose you need to you, you need to be kind of um, tapped in and, 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 and you know on the keeping an eye on what the, what what are those trends uh, as they emerge. Emerging. Yeah. I mean, is that is that? Do you think that's a, an appetite to, or an attitude to risk? I, I definitely like the cutting edge kind of thing. I think that's really important. Yeah. You know, I don't know about the longer term kind of thing. <laughs> the older I get, the shorter term I want it to be. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think yeah. there's good points. You just got to balance it out and yeah, think about absolutely. as an investor what works for you. Yeah, because there's a level of of having the business de-risk, but yet, yeah, yeah, there is it. Mm -hmm. Maeve, any thoughts on that? For me, I'll echo Shane's first point that there's a need for the product or service to exist so it's solving a problem or you know 
it's realistic that it should exist in the world. Mm. Um, and then, you know, you just mentioned risk. I guess the other thing for me that I would be looking closely at, and I, I feel it in our customer base, is there is still a fear there for new investors or for people who are going in again. Like, to ask people to reach outside their kind of comfort zone to invest in something that they don't know about, you need to educate them. You need to bring them into your circle of competency. Mm -hmm. Um, and you have to make sure that everyone in the room understands what it is they're buying a piece of. Mm. Yeah, so that's one of the advantages of, the, of a syndicate environment, whereby you're able to yeah. leverage that knowledge of in the room. Absolutely. Um, yeah, really important. Um, I, I, I just open the floor to um, any questions. Anybody have any questions for our panel before we wrap up? Any particular thoughts? Yeah. Hi there. Um, you haven't talked at all about, say, investing in the entertainment. I mean, I don't know, everything seems to be very much IT or food or medicine uh, related. You know, um, does angel investing include, I always thought it did, going more into like be, uh, investing in films, for example. I don't know if any of the panel yeah, have so any yeah, so ideas yeah, or sorry. theories on that. I'm fundraising for a documentary right now, so we should talk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we do have some um, sectors uh, specific syndicates. Um, entertainment isn't isn't one. We do also have um, a, the forum, which is an open environment, and we have it that's sector agnostic. So as long as there is a scalable business there, um, that's really the key for what we're looking for, and that there's a product market fit, um, and you know, and a global opportunity um, with a good founding team. As we all mentioned earlier, that's, that's really key to it. Uh, we are sector agnostic in the forum, um, but the syndicates will be sort of more sector specific, ICT, life sciences, med tech and telcos, uh, food. Um, and, and that's really just about the need and the, um, the kind of deal flow that we're getting through. But absolutely. The tech sector is green with jealousy of section 28, the tax relief that um, investors get in the film section sector. Um, so, you know, that's something we're trying to fix the tax situation in, in the innovation sectors. The creative sectors already have that in theory fixed. So, yeah. Great. Any other questions from the, from the floor? Anybody else to ask with? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, Marion, I was just uh, interested to know in your future trends if there is uh, interest in emerging markets. You mentioned the trend around digital and that enabling further afield investment. So I was interested in emerging markets and what you're seeing there. You know, there's, there is um, a, a segment of the population who's you know, interested in social, um, social kind of companies, impact companies, and they've been investing a lot in Africa. So I'm hearing about that a lot in a couple of um, accelerators that are focused on that. But it's, it, right now that's a small piece of, of the angel market, I would say. We do have some uh, companies that are focused on that area. Yeah, in, yeah absolutely. Yeah, uh, there are a lot of interest in India as well. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Is there any other questions there? Quick question for the three entrepreneurs. If you were given an extra million today, what would be the one thing straight away would pop into your mind you'd spend it on? <laughs> Good question. Uh, Good for, question. For us, it's entirely engineering driven. Um, that's sort of our, our stumbling block right now is uh, because we're a pretty tech intensive company. Um, almost all of our resources in the first 18 months are going to engineering, so um, that's our answer. Okay. I would say it would probably be something along those lines as well. It would be upgrading CapEx automation. Um, that's, that's what I would do. Was it, did you mean in relation to their own companies or did you mean uh, sectors outside of their own businesses? No, just what to do with their own business. With their own businesses, yeah. Maeve? At different levels. Thanks for describing me as an entrepreneur. I'm part of an entrepreneurial team. Uh, my Wall Street will take it. And, um, it would be very similar to Shane's. I'm echoing a few of your sentiments today, but we're chasing our tail with developments. We have to go quicker and we, we never have enough time. So it would be a huge spend on extra resources, the right people for, for the next build. Yeah, great, thank you so much. Have we uh, finished any more questions? No, great. Well, look, I'd like to thank my panel. Thank you to Neve Bushnell from Tech Ireland, May Revan from My Wall Street, formerly Rubicoin, Alvin Hunt from Hexafly, Shane Curran from Evervolt, and Marianne Hudson. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.